What is the first step in utilizing analytical procedures in substantive testing? Well, the first step here is going to be to develop an expectation of a balance or ratio by using relationships that are expected to exist. Right, we obviously have a whole lesson on analytical procedures. You developing expectations and then testing ratios to make sure that they're in line with your expectations. Identifying reasonable ex explanations for unexpected differences before talking to client management helps the auditor in assessing if management's explanation is reasonable. Management's explanation should always be corroborated with other evidence. Whatever is said, remember professional skepticism, always verify. Now, again, the reason we're talking so much about analytical procedures is because they can be used in the testing phase, which makes them substantive procedures. We see here the planning phase has 0.1, testing is 2, and final review is 0.3 here. Analytical procedures are used throughout the audit process and are conducted for three primary purposes. We've got preliminary, which you know, this is really covered in our analytical procedures lesson, so feel free to read this and check that out as well. Then here, focusing on specifically substantive analytical procedures, they are used as substantive procedures when the auditor considers that the use of analytical procedures can be more effective or efficient than tests of details in reducing the risk of material misstatements at the assertion level to an acceptably low level. Remember the effectiveness and the efficiency of an audit, those risks, just throw back, trying to make sure you remember those. And then lastly, final analytical review. These procedures are performed as a part of an overall review of the financial statements at the end of the audit to assess whether they're consistent with the auditor's understanding of the entity. Final procedures are not conducted to obtain additional substantive assurance. It's only during this phase, during the testing phase, and just on a good note, whenever you're taking the exam, answering questions, try to think what phase of the audit am I in? Am I in engagement acceptance, planning, testing, final review, conclusion, whatever it is. Make sure you understand that because that could help you to eliminate a lot of possibly incorrect answers. If irregularities are found, risk assessment should be performed again to consider any additional audit procedures are necessary. Definitely want to make a point there. But again, you're only doing substantive procedures to obtain reasonable assurance during the testing phase. If you hit the final analytical review phase and you have some irregularities, you have to actually go back to the testing phase. Talking a little bit more about these procedures in the final review phase. What would these include? Let's actually put some procedures to the name. This would include considering the adequacy of the evidence gathered in response to unexpected balances identified during the planning stage. Also reading the financial statements and considering whether there are any unusual or unexpected balances that were previously not identified. Also, if any unexpected relationships or unexpected balances are identified, additional tests of details are required. So it's kind of just a, a catch-all, a net at the end. That's the purpose of these analytical procedures at the end is, right, you, you did everything and you think you did everything properly, but then at the end, you perform a third level of analytical procedures, right, after your planning, testing, and now review. And then once you get here, if you find anything that you did not expect, well, you got to go back, like I said, to the testing stage and continue to get evidence for reasonable assurance. Lastly here, comparing the current year's financial statements with prior year statements. And if let's say the cash balance is ridiculously different than last year's. Maybe during your testing phase, you had enough evidence to suggest why it's you know, that they increased revenues and that makes sense. And they collected that money. However, if there's no reason and you didn't collect that rationale from the testing phase, well, then uh, you got to go back to the testing phase and kind of figure out a reason why, why for the large variance. Talking about here the explanations for the results of analytical procedures, right? Definitely want to make sure that you have sufficient explanations. These procedures are used to obtain an understanding of the financial statements. In general, analytical procedures are used to test financial statement assertions. For example, an auditor might use analytical procedures to test the existence assertion for accounts receivable. This would involve comparing the accounts receivable balance to the sales on credit for the period. As I've said in multiple lessons, think about your journal entries. When you have like analytical procedures is the process of comparing debits and credits. If you have a debit to AR of 10,000 and a credit to revenue of 10,000, that makes sense because when you debit AR, you credit revenue. Think about that for a second, right? Similarly, if you debit cash for 10,000, maybe you're gonna credit unearned service revenue for 10,000. Think about those journal entries and their corresponding uh, relationships with each other using analytical procedures to make sure that they're in line. If the two amounts are not reasonably close, then the auditor would have to investigate further. Now, hopefully during the, the testing phase, you found some reasons for why they're different. There are two main types of procedures, comparative and trend analysis. Comparative analysis 
This is going to involve comparing two or more financial statements from different periods. This is typically done to identify unusual items or trends. Now, trend analysis, this is going to involve studying financial statement data over time to identify trends. So let's say you're auditing for five years and every year you see revenues going up by 5%, right? It's important to keep that in your permanent file so that when you go back to this current year audit, you see that revenue went down by 10%. You're like, okay, well, you know, this is not consistent with the trends I've been seeing over the last five years. Definitely want to investigate that. If you investigate it and find out that the whole industry is down, obviously, I think you have your answer there. This can be used to predict future financial statement amounts, and then you predict the amounts if they're not in line with those amounts. And again, it's not going to be perfect, right? But as long as you have reasons for why the reality, what the real results are not in line with the expected amounts, then you're good. Several reasons why analytical procedures might produce results that are not what the auditor expected. First, the financial statements could be incorrect. <laughs> That's definitely a, a reason and why we do what we do. This could be due to errors or fraud. And second, the assumptions used in the analytical procedures might be incorrect. The assumption being that we'll keep increasing revenue by 5%, not taking into account that maybe there's a recession, right? Finally, the results might simply be due to chance. That just does happen. The auditor finds that the results of the analytical procedures are not what was expected. The auditor should investigate further. This might involve testing additional financial statement assertions or performing alternative procedures. We're learning a lot and having a good time while doing it. Let's keep powering through. If the auditor has doubt about the truthfulness of management's explanations, the auditor should consider whether the explanations are reasonable and, most importantly, supported by evidence. You know, if uh, management gives you a completely unreasonable answer, but then they give you evidence for it, okay, if that evidence is, you know, independent and you've assessed it, then that should be good to go. The auditor should also consider whether the explanations are consistent with other information known about the entity. Next up, if the auditor inevitably does not agree with management's explanations for the results of analytical procedures, meaning, okay, expenses dropped by 20%, well, that's a little, you know, it's a, that's a pretty big drop. And management says, oh yeah, we just cut costs. But then you go in and see nothing really changed throughout the, the business. The auditor should bring this to the attention of those parts of governance because management could be trying to hide something. They could be trying to understate their expenses. Disagreements with management are covered in depth further in other lessons, right? communication, engagement, conclusions at the end. Obviously, we've got the option of giving a qualified opinion. Analytical procedures, let's keep talking about this, coming into a wrap pretty soon. If analytical procedures are used as a test of transactions to corroborate management's financial statement assertions, that was if analytical procedures are used in the testing phase as substantive procedures, they are functioning as a substantive test rather than a final analytical procedure, making sure we're classifying these procedures in their proper right states. When analytical procedures are used in the principal substantive tests, meaning the, the first round of testing of significant financial statement assertions, the, the auditor is required to document both the expectation and the factors considered in developing that expectation. So if you expect uh, revenue to be at $10 million, but you see it, it's at 12, you're supposed to document, well, first off, we expected revenue to be at 10 million. And then why did we assume that? Well, it's because consistently revenue has gone up by 5% every year. Now, analytical procedures are not used to test controls. Definitely make a note there. They're required in the planning stage. Okay, lots of great points to, to note. I am just butchering it with the uh, drawing here. I know, I know. I'm not an art, I'm not an art major. I'm not an art uh, expertise, but I'm sure some of you maybe are. And to some extent in the final review stage by generally accepted auditing standards. So you have to perform limited analytical procedures in the final review stage. However, there's no required to use them as substantive tests. You are not required to use analytical procedures here. Analytical procedures are more likely to be used for accounts that are predictable and as such should display a pattern. If every single year, like for a uh, high frequency trading firm or hedge fund, that is going to depend very based on the market. You know, maybe that might not work, but for a consistent, reliable company that, and even within that company, only for the accounts that are regularly displaying patterns, you should use analytical procedures there. You know, if there's no pattern at all, and quite reasonably, the business model change every year. If you have a construction company, it really just depends on when they get construction projects, you know, when they're completing them on time. So analytical procedures might not be applicable there. Lastly here, the revenue account and the revenue cycle should always be tested. Take a note that revenue should always be tested and have an analytical procedures performed as there is a presumption of revenue fraud in all audits per the AICPA. Why is that? Because revenue is the 
item to be most likely overstated to make the financial statements look better. Maybe those managers want to get their bonuses or something like that, right? Based on their earnings per share, based on viewing those financial statements. Let's talk about right here, the following accounts should be tested and analyzed together in audit documentation. This is kind of what I was saying before, right? Where a debit to uh, accounts receivable has a corresponding credit to sales revenue. Now, just two points to keep in mind, talking journal entries. I know you should be loving journal entries. I know a lot of people don't. Uh, I love them just because they, uh, they don't lie. They tell a story. And it's a great way to find items that correspond with each other. So for the notes receivable account, what is the corresponding account? What are the related accounts here? Well, we have interest income and interest receivable. Let's think about that for a second. As notes receivable increases, we should see an increase in interest income and interest receivable. You know, same with uh, any general assets, right? The more, uh, let's say, bonds we own from other people, the more interest income we should reasonably see. Or the more debt we accrue, the more interest expense we should see. And so similarly here, whether it's note payable or whether it's bonds payable, if we see an increase in bonds payable, we should see a corresponding increase in interest expense and interest payable. Uh, these are just two examples. Obviously, I mentioned a few others here, but just think about those journal entries. You should see a corresponding increase or decrease depending on the relationship with each other in the financial statements. Talking about our testing correlations and predictions, relationships between income statement accounts tend to be more predictable than balance sheet accounts as they represent transactions over a period of time rather than a point in time. And that kind of makes sense if we're thinking about the income statement, right? Generally, you know, in my experience, at least seeing this uh, pretty, pretty amount in the real world, we see revenues, like I was saying before, increase by 5% each year. Obviously, it just depends on the market, depends on a lot of factors. However, you may have a lot of cash this year because maybe you got some you know, extra funding. It just really depends. Cash could very much change. Inventory can change a lot. However, over a period of time, right? It's going to kind of average out to be about the same, whereas for a specific point in time, it goes up, down, up, down, up, down. Therefore, analytical procedures of income statement accounts would likely yield a higher level of evidence than those of balance sheet accounts. Making notes of these here, you can definitely see these as questions on the exam. right? And why is this so important? Analytical procedures will tie in with our substantive procedures because we know we can use them as such, as well as we perform analytical procedures. And that also is going to form the basis for how many substantive procedures we need to inevitably do. These income statement accounts could include payroll expense, interest expense, right? Should be pretty consistent unless you obtain a crazy amount of debt. Payroll expense, you know, it, it should be in line. The more employees you hire, the higher your payroll expense goes. So you can tie it to something and you could perform analytical procedures and see the trends as we hire more employees, we see a higher payroll expense and you should be able to see those ratios increase, you know, for every two employees, we see a 10% uh, increase in payroll expense or you know like a $10,000 increase in payroll expense you know whatever that might look like any other expense such as operating expense various revenue accounts etc here now additionally relationships between transactions that are subject to management discretion such as travel entertainment and benefits are less predictable right management wants to spend a lot of money on travel this year uh, it's less predictable because there is a human element there a human mind is making that decision whereas here just the more people we hire the higher the payroll expense will be if the results of these analytical procedures disclose unexpected differences, the auditor should consider that the financial statements may contain a material misstatement. That's something that we should always consider. Do we assume there is? No, we don't assume that there's a material misstatement. However, we consider it and we take it as a concern, right? We want to make sure to watch out for it. In auditing each financial statement, the auditor should reconcile the various statements together, such as comparing the balance sheet retained earnings to the income statement which, I mean, that's pretty important, right? Because revenues minus expenses equals net income. Remember this relationship from you know, basic financial accounting, that net income then flows to the balance sheet in the form of retained earnings. So we see an increase in retained earnings should, you know, a nice easy formula would be revenues minus expenses equals the change in retained earnings from year to year. Now, obviously we have to take into account possibly any dividends or you know, contributions to the entity, but that would be something to take into account. The statement of cash flows, we should see a correlation. But as we're auditing, right, you got to be analytical. You got to think like uh, you know, you got to be incredibly smart and sharp and on 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 the edge here, right? If you see increases in statement of cash flows, 
$10 million of cash inflows should correlate, and you should be able to find that on, let's say, the bank statement and see those cash inflows, tying them all together. Let's talk about the decision to use analytical procedures as substantive tests. Now, let's also talk about a little bit of a background. Analytical procedures, we know, can be done for a review, which is substantially less in scope than an audit. And that should paint a good picture of why these procedures require less work and are more cost effective to perform than substantive procedures, which you know, we do for an audit. So again, the fact that analytical procedures are done for a review, which is cheaper and easier to do than an audit, that alone shows that analytical procedures are going to be done when you want to cut down on work and just there's a lot less requirements when it comes to them. Analytical procedures can be as simple as pulling down a formula in Excel to compare balances, right? Think about yourself uh, looking at Excel and you're just dragging that formula down and showing the percentage variances between year to year on financial statements. Substantive procedures re require contact with third parties, personnel on site, and many other costly actions. That's going to require significant more investment. Now, the decision as to whether or not to use analytical procedures as tests is based on availability, reliability, and precision of the data used to develop the expectations. Substantive analytical procedures play an important part in a risk-based audit approach. Properly designed and executed analytical procedures can allow the auditor to achieve audit objectives more efficiently by reducing or replacing other detailed audit testing, which again is more costly. And lastly, the effectiveness of analytical procedures depends on the auditor's understanding of the entity and its environment and the use of professional judgment. Therefore, these analytical procedures, they should be performed or reviewed by senior members of the engagement team. It's like I said, right, those connections to be made, I'm going to be honest, it took me quite a while to make those connections uh, between different accounts, making sure that one's increasing with the other. That is something that I learned from a lot of very intelligent people throughout years working in the industry. So obviously, senior members are going to be more adept at that. They're going to just have seen more. You can be incredibly smart, memorize a lot, but it's going to come from those experiences where you see discrepancies between different accounts that you're going to apply that to every single audit you see. So like I, I worked with people where someone saw a lot of issues within the cash account. They're kind of the relative cash expert. Someone's the AR expert because they've seen a lot of issues when it came to AR. Everyone kind of makes out those specialties for themselves. Now, it's vital that the analytical procedures be sufficiently documented. And that's, I, I just document everything, right? It is the general rule. Now, to enable an experienced auditor having no previous connection with the audit to understand the work done, this ties heavily into our uh, audit documentation, right? As a general rule, I mean, you probably have heard this if you worked uh, in a firm or a company, just whatever you've done, you want to have it sufficiently documented so that someone can come in and see what you did and redo it. Because guess what? There's a lot of high turnover and uh, someone should be able to come back in and all of that work you did, hopefully not you know, being for naught. It's not just thrown out because something you did was incredibly correct and great. But the thing is, no one can understand how you did it. And even if they can, they got to spend a lot of time understanding what the heck you did. Analytical procedures can be done for a review, which is substantially less in scope than an audit. So like I said, this is kind of what I was saying before. This is actually exactly what I was saying before. So just another note to keep this in mind, watch out for analytical procedures they can help significantly. Hey there, are you ready to not only pass your CPA exams, but truly understand and enjoy the material while studying? I know it seems impossible, right? Especially to enjoy the material? We'll do it together. Tap into the power of cpa.examprep.ai, where we've got personalized quizzes, multiple choice questions, memorization guides, flashcards, simulations, all tailored to your learning. Our adaptive study planning puts you on the fastest path to success and lifts you back up if you fall behind. Avoid wasting your precious time and money attempting an exam with a low chance of passing because who wants that? We want to get you through this process as quick as possible. Our exam readiness prediction lets you walk in with confidence knowing that you're prepared for success on exam day. Thankfully, there's no payment method needed to get started. So why don't you come join us? Visit cpa.examprep.ai and let's achieve your exam success together. 